people like to have heroes, inspiring characters we can look up to. But in the real world, no one is perfect, not even the most revered and respected historical figures. And it does no service to truth or justice to ignore the errors, moral and intellectual, of the supposed heroes of the past. We can learn from history and improve upon it only if we dare to see and embrace what others got right while also seeing and rejecting what they got wrong. Americans may not like hearing it, but the Founding Fathers got some things wrong. They also got a lot right. But we shouldn't be so desperate to have someone to believe in that we ignored the contradictions and the hypocrisy in some of the things the Founders did and said. As an obvious example, with all their talk about unalienable rights and all men being created equal, the Founders created a legal system which not only tolerated but enforced the most egregious violation of those principles imaginable, slavery. In early drafts of the Declaration of Independence, Thomas Jefferson, though a slave owner himself, condemned the institution of slavery, referring to it as a, quote, cruel war against human nature itself, violating its most sacred rights of life and liberty. But some delegates of the Continental Congress refused to sign the Declaration until those words were removed. So fundamental principles were compromised, and profound injustice was allowed to continue for the sake of political expedience. This does not mean we should dismiss everything the Founders said and did, but it does demonstrate that in order to learn from history, instead of unconditionally revering any document or any individual, thinking people need to separate out the wisdom from the mistakes. Thomas Jefferson himself lamented the fact that some people, quote, look at constitutions with sanctimonious reverence and deem them like the Ark of the Covenant, too sacred to be touched, and warn that people should not, quote, ascribe to the men of the preceding age a wisdom more than human and suppose what they did to be beyond amendment. It's no secret that power corrupts, and history is full of examples of the oppressed becoming the new oppressors. George Washington was the military leader of the American Revolution, which was in large part a tax revolt. Several years later, as the first U.S. president, he personally led the military show of force, which put down a new tax revolt, known as the Whiskey Rebellion. Before the Revolution, John Adams was a vocal critic of British rule, saying, quote, The jaws of power are always open to devour, and her arm is always stretched out, if possible, to destroy the freedom of thinking, speaking, and writing. Then, when he became the second U.S. President, Adams signed into law the Aliens and Sedition Act, essentially making it a crime to criticize government. It is easy for the powerless to complain about injustice, but just as easy for freedom fighters to become tyrants once the power is in their hands. The Declaration of Independence was essentially a condemnation of authoritarian power and an argument for individual liberty and unalienable rights. In contrast, the Constitution was a list of new powers to be given to the new ruling class. Where the Declaration explains that all men are created equal, the Constitution claims to grant to certain people the power to tax and to regulate where the Declaration states that the people have the duty to throw off any government which becomes a violator of individual rights, the Constitution claims to grant to Congress the right to forcibly crush any attempts at insurrection. In short, the message of the Declaration of Independence was to empower the individual, but the purpose of the Constitution was to empower the new central government. At the time, both proponents and critics of the proposed Constitution acknowledged that its main purpose was to energize, strengthen, and expand the power of the national government as compared to what had existed under the Articles of Confederation. Many Americans think of the Founding Fathers as a group of men who all believed and advocated the same thing and think of the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution as being inseparable documents written by the same people and based on the same principles. In reality, many of the names most strongly associated with the American Revolution were not supporters of the new Constitution, and rather than seeing it as the natural continuation of the principles expressed in the Declaration of Independence, saw it as a betrayal and the first step toward tyranny. Patrick Henry, whose Give Me Liberty or Give Me Death speech is perhaps the most famous rallying cry for American independence, zealously rallied against the Constitution, predicting that it would destroy state sovereignty and result in serious violations of individual rights and the destruction of liberty. Mr. Henry even refused to attend the Constitutional Convention, saying, I smell a rat. Likewise, Thomas Paine, whose pamphlet Common Sense is widely regarded as the primary inspiration for the American Revolution, was also a vehement critic and opponent of the new Constitution. The victors write the history books, but looking back at the debates between the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists, 
It's clear that the supporters of the Constitution were just wrong in their predictions and assurances, and those warning that the Constitution would lead to abuse and tyranny were right. Consider a few of the main points of contention between the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists. The Anti-Federalists predicted that giving the new federal government the power to tax would result in abuse and oppression, while the Federalists insisted that federal tax collectors, if they existed at all, would be few and far between, mainly on the coast enforcing import and export taxes, would rarely, if ever, resort to using internal taxes, and would be nowhere near the number of tax collectors that would exist at the state level. On all these points, the Federalists were dead wrong. In contrast, the predictions of Patrick Henry regarding what the taxing clause would lead to were a lot closer to the truth. The officers of Congress may come upon you now, fortified with all the terrors of paramount federal authority. Excise men may come in multitudes, for the limitation of their numbers no man knows. Patrick Henry. The current federal tax system, which extorts around $3 trillion a year from well over 100 million Americans by way of the notoriously abusive and corrupt IRS, is far more burdensome and intrusive than anything the King of England ever inflicted on the American colonies. And the alleged authority for all of it comes from the taxing clause of the U.S. Constitution. In this scheme of energetic government, the people will find two sets of tax gatherers, the state and the federal sheriffs. The federal sheriff may commit what oppression, make what distresses he pleases, and ruin you with impunity. For how are you to tie his hands? Patrick Henry. Anti-Federalists also warned about the military powers which the Constitution would give to the new federal government, including giving it control of the militia. Again, the Federalists insisted that there was no threat of imperial warmongering and that the U.S. military would never become more powerful than the people or the state militias. Again, the predictions of Patrick Henry were a lot closer to the mark. If your American chief be a man of ambition and abilities, how easy is it for him to render himself absolute? The army is in his hands, and if he be a man of address, it will be attached to him, and it will be the subject of long meditation with him to seize the first auspicious moment to accomplish his design. Patrick Henry. Regarding the question of whether the U.S. military has been used purely defensively, or as a tool of imperial conquest, keep in mind that in the history of the country there has only been one foreign invasion of U.S. soil during the War of 1812. The 1941 attack on Pearl Harbor could debatably be included as a second example, although that was a strike on a military target rather than a true invasion, and occurred back before Hawaii was a state. Nonetheless, more often than not, for more than two centuries since the Constitution was ratified, the U.S. military has been engaged in numerous violent conflicts around the world, usually at the bidding of the President without a declaration of war from Congress, exactly what Patrick Henry warned about. The Federalists also insisted that a Bill of Rights was not necessary and shouldn't be included in the Constitution. Eventually it was included, only because of the states that refused to ratify the Constitution without a Bill of Rights. Today, the U.S. government routinely violates nearly all of the principles expressed in the Bill of Rights anyway. Interestingly, the Commerce Clause of the Constitution, which has served as the legal excuse for the vast majority of Congress's regulatory and legislative intrusions into the lives of the American people, was hardly even mentioned in the debates between the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists. The regulation of commerce, it is true, is a new power, but that seems to be an addition which few oppose and from which no apprehensions are entertained. James Madison in short, the Federalists predicted that the new federal government created by the Constitution would be far smaller, far less expensive, and far less powerful than the state governments, and would pose no real threat to the freedom of the American people. The number of individuals employed under the Constitution of the United States will be much smaller than the number employed under the particular states. James Madison. In contrast, the Anti-Federalists predicted that the supposed checks and balances and the ability of the people to vote every few years would not stop the new government from becoming powerful, corrupt, expensive, and abusive. I might say that the expense will be multiplied tenfold. 
I might tell you of a numerous standing army, a great powerful navy, a long and rapacious train of officers and dependents, independent of the President, senators, and representatives, whose compensations are without limitation. Patrick Henry warned that by giving Congress the control of the purse, via the power to tax, and control of the sword, via the military, the Constitution would lead to a tyranny worse than existed under a king. In spite of the assurances and predictions of the Federalists, the U.S. Constitution created what would become the most powerful authoritarian empire the world has ever known, with the biggest war machine and the largest and most intrusive extortion racket in history. By any objective measure, the American people were oppressed far less by a king than they are now, by the representative republic created by the Constitution. The sad truth is that the list of abuses committed by King George, as enumerated in the Declaration of Independence, signed here in 1776, pales in comparison to the injustices being inflicted on the American people today by their own constitutional republic. Contrary to the assurances of the Federalists, every power which the Constitution granted to the federal government under the promise that such powers would be used sparingly and only to serve the people, have been used to subjugate the people while enriching and empowering the ruling elite. And with the possible exception of the Third Amendment, every article in the Bill of Rights is violated every day in every state of the Union by federal agents. By any objective measure, the United States Constitution utterly failed to keep government limited, failed to preserve individual rights, and is still used as the justification for all of the federal taxation, regulation, warmongering, criminalization, surveillance, and other governmental controls and intrusions being inflicted upon the American people and on people of many other countries around the world. So if you ask me whether I support the document which ended up creating the most powerful authoritarian empire in the history of the world, no, I don't. To paraphrase Lysander Spooner, the Constitution was either intended to create the government we have now, or it failed to prevent the government we have now. Either way, it was a mistake. If you ask whether I want to try the same thing again while hoping for a drastically different outcome, no, I don't. If you ask me whether I believe that a piece of parchment can defend liberty, no, I don't. If you ask me whether I think any government has ever or will ever truly represent and serve the people it taxes and controls, no, I don't. If you ask me whether I think elections or constitutions or any political process of any kind can ever create real peace, justice, and freedom, no, I don't. Now, if you ask me whether I think we have anything to learn from the Founding Fathers, yes, I most certainly do. We can learn from their successes and their failures, from their virtues and wisdom, and from their vices and mistakes. The founders were right when they explained that all men are created equal and have inherent rights that do not come from government and that outrank anything man-made legislation can ever do. They were right when they spoke about natural law and the unalienable right that every individual has, the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. They were right when they advocated disobeying and resisting the arbitrary and unjust commands of a supposed authority. They were right when they said that the people have a duty to cast off any government that becomes a violator of individual rights. They were right to say that human organizations should be based upon consent, but they were wrong in thinking that government could be a part of it. They were wrong in their assumption that political power could ever be good or legitimate or could ever make society what it should be. Basically, they were right about every power that they said government should not have and wrong about every power they said government should have. If there is anything to be learned from the American experiment, it's that limited government is a myth, that political authority cannot be kept in check by any document, any political process, any election, or any supposed system of checks and balances. If the American experiment proved anything, it's that once the seed of authoritarian power has been planted, however small and limited it may seem at first, it will find a way to grow, and it will become a threat to peace, justice, and freedom. But the revolution is not over. In the end, the revolutions which happen with guns and bombs are not what matter. What matters, what has the ability to improve things, is the revolution of the mind. We can't fix the world by changing authoritarian regimes, only by changing the paradigms inside our own heads. As long as some men claim the right to rule, and others claim the right to be free, the revolution will continue. Final victory will come only when humanity as a whole gives up its faith in authoritarianism and statism, and embraces instead the principles of true equality, of non-aggression, of self-ownership, of voluntarism, when people are truly ready to be free.